So hi again, I hope the coffee was good. So let's talk now about the, this stream API, which is uh, once again a new thing in, uh, in the Java 8, and probably something that will really change the way we, we program applications very deeply. First, what is a stream? From a pure technical point of view, it's a typed interface. So we'll be talking about a stream of persons, or a stream of strings, or of integer, whatever. I have other classes for primitive types, once again for performance reasons, to avoid spending time boxing and unboxing integer longs and doubles. A stream might look like a collection, but it's not a collection. It is built on a source, and this source can be a collection or an array. We will see examples of that. I don't need to provide any data to a stream at build time. So a stream doesn't hold any data, which is much different from a collection, of course, because in a collection I have data. And I have no limit on what the source can produce. So a source can be some kind of infinite producer of, uh, of objects, of data. So a stream can be built on a collection or an array. It can be built on a on an existing iterator or on an input-output source. Some of those can be infinite, so I, I will need some way to deal with uh, this infinity and, of course, to uh, guarantee that the computations will be conducted infinite time, of course. So first of all, a stream doesn't hold any data. It makes it a very, very light object, even to handle uh, several millions of object collections. I will be able to declare operations on it, so I can see this object on a, uh, as an object on which I can specify uh, operations. Second, a stream cannot modify its source. It's a contract. Um, if I do that, I might run into trouble, so I don't want to do that. And the consequence of it is that I, I will be able to use parallel processing. I'll be able to parallelize my processing um, easily, at least as a user probably not as an API writer, um, to, um, to use parallel processing. Third point, the source can be infinite, so I need a way to guarantee that the, that the computations will be uh, conducted in infinite time. And a stream works lazily. This is very important. You remember before the pause, I showed you an example where laziness was really needed to bring optimization. The streams inherently works lazily. So it will, uh, it will allow this kind of optimization. And once again, I need a way to, to trigger the computation because uh, if it works lazily, I, I still need to compute things at the end of the day. Is a stream the same as a collection? The answer is no. It's not a collection. A collection provides a mean to access the element one by one, which is not the case for a stream. A collection does not provide any mean to process its elements with lambdas, the map filter and reduce methods we just showed before the pose are not being uh, added to the collection interface. They are being ad added to the stream interface. So how, how can we build a stream? Let's uh, have a look at several patterns. There are many more. First, I can, build a stream, I can call the stream method on collection. This is the first, the first pattern. I have uh, an th this arrays um, class with all these static methods. There's a one more method called stream, which allows me to build a stream on an array. On this example, an array of strings. I also have factory method in a stream class. Remember, stream is an interface, and I can put static method in interfaces in Java 8. So let's use it. So stream of 1, 2, 3 will bring me uh, a stream of strings. I've got other patterns, streams.empty, which returns an empty stream, stream with a single element, stream generate, generate takes a lambda expression, which is a supplier, the supplier doesn't take any parameter and returns a, a new object, and I can iterate by passing a seed and an array operator, and an array operator is a special type of function, takes an object, returns an object of the same type. And I've got many other ways, all in the JDK, in existing classes, to build strings, to build the streams, sorry. I've got a cars method on a string class, 
that returns an int stream. I've got a lines method on buffered reader that returns a stream of uh, a stream of string with each string being a line of the file I want to read. I've got the ints, longs, and doubles method on the random class to build the streams of uh, random uh, numbers and many others. I also have a build method, which is a static method of the stream interface, which returns a stream builder. A stream builder is a, is a little uh, a tricky to use. It builds a stream with a special cycle. First I add elements and then I get those elements back in stream. I also have a couple of, uh, of two interfaces, called a class stream support and an interface called splitterator. Those two last patterns are mostly for uh, API writer. This is a, a copy paste of the Javadoc. So the Javadoc clearly state that we shouldn't be using that in normal application. It's merely uh, provided for uh, uh, API writers. Okay. So let's have a look at our first example. Person dot streams that builds a stream on the list, list of persons, of course. Then I declare operations map and filter. This is my good old pattern, map filter reduce. And then I reduce, the calling the reduce method will trigger the computation. This last method triggers the computation so the map and the filter doesn't do anything. The reduce call does the job, well, triggers the job at, last, at, at least. This zero I pass as a first parameter of the reduce method is in fact the default value in the case the stream is empty. Even if I provide a list of person that is not empty, first I map it, then I filter it, the, the result of the filtering might be an empty list. So I need to take care of this, of this case. So here is the default value uh, of my reduction. There are two types of operations being defined on a stream. The first type is called intermediate operation. Those operations are merely declaration and they are processed lazily. That is, uh, uh, calling map on a stream doesn't do any computation. Remember, there's no data in the stream, so the data will not be pulled from the source by the stream when I call map. And the same goes for filter. And then, to trigger the computation, I've got ter terminal operations. Reduce is a terminal operation. Calling this method will effectively trigger the computation. That is, the stream is going to pull out the data from the source and begins to compute everything. And since when this uh, operation is triggered, the stream has a complete knowledge of all the operations that have been declared on it, it can optimize things and laziness, of course, is the first optimization. A stream has a state, it doesn't hold any data in the sense that there is no, there's no persons in my stream, but it still has a state and this is very important to, to um, at least to likely understand that because it, it will have an, a, a huge impact, or well, it can have a huge impact on performance. So the first thing is size. The size is the, the fact that I know how many elements this stream will pull from the source. Uh, if my stream is built on an error list, for, instan for instance, or, or on, on whatever list, uh, this list has a size. I know how many elements there are in this list, so my stream is sized. Ordered mean that the order matter it is not the same as the sorted, which means that the, sort, the, the elements have been sorted. The difference is that a, a list is ordered in the sense that each element has an index. There is a first element, a second element, a tenth element, and so forth, and, and so on and so forth. So this is ordered. It means that the order uh, in the list has a matter. It doesn't, um, the, the, the order notion, the notion of order is not defined in the collection. It's defined in the list, in the, in the collection framework. So if I build a stream on a list, this stream will be ordered. If I build a stream on a set, uh, I can't have the, the same element twice in the set, uh, as you all know. So the stream is distinct, and this is another flag. And of course, the, the last one, the sorted, uh, means that all the elements have been sorted, which is the case if I build a stream on a sorted set. Some of the elements will change uh, the state of the stream. For instance, filtering. If I filter my list of person, I can't uh, guess how many person will, will go through the filter. So the size, the flag, is set to false because I don't know how many elements uh, I will have in my result. The mapping, for instance, remove the distinct flag. Why? Because 
uh, if I map my person to their ages, I will have less ages than persons. So the so I'll have doubles in my in, in my list. So it's not a distinct list anymore. And the same for goes for sorted. And this uh, state allows for very nice optimization. Suppose I have a hash set, and I build a, hash set, a stream on this hash set, hash set, and somebody calls distinct on this stream. Well, distinct doesn't have to do anything, because an hash set is already a set of distinct elements. So this is an optimization I can, I can have, if I, uh, thanks to this uh, state. The same goes for the tree set. The tree set is inherently sorted. So if I call sorted on a tree set, well, the, I, I, I don't need to do anything. And of course, the stream API and the stream implementation for our set knows that and can optimize um, its, its execution with this kind of information. So if I, got, if I have in, in some part of my code a list of string, some, somebody populate the, this list with many strings, and in another part of my code, I just build a, a stream on this, lit, uh, on this list, I call the sorted a method on it, and I collect all these in the list. Collection of the stream, we'll see that in details uh, in a few minutes, but basically what does it do? It takes the elements processed by the stream, and it puts them in a list. It's quite, uh, I think it's quite simple to, to guess that. What does it do? Okay, it, the, the, the list of, uh, of strings will be sorted in a natural order, but if someone, some guy changes the implementation of uh, a real list and, and, takes a, uh, and makes a sorted set with it, in, um, instead of the list. I don't need to change my code. I don't need to change this code to be performant. The sorted has already been made, so the implementation will realize that, and the sorted uh, call on the stream uh, will be a no operation call, which is very nice. I love that. <coughs> In a stream, one has to understand that there are stateless and stateful operations. And this will, once again, have an impact on performance, and especially on parallel performance. What is a stateless operation? A stateless operation is a, an operation that, don't need, that doesn't need more information than the one provided in the input parameters. When I say person gives person dot get age, the age of the person can be determined inside the object person with no uh, other information. So this is a stateless operation. All the operations are not stateless, of course. If I call, for instance, limit on a stream, limit, I, I, give, a, I give a number uh, as a parameter of, uh, of a limit call, and what does it say? It says, okay, I only want to pull the 10 here, the 10 million, 10 million first elements of the stream. Now, to, to be sure that the elements I want to pull from the, from the source of, of the stream, sorry. Now, to be sure that I want to pull only 10 million elements from the source, I need to count them. So I need a counter, and this counter is a state of the, uh, of the stream. It's, a, it's not an information that is held in the, in the, in the limit call. And by the way, this call is a, might raise problem if I want to go parallel with that. We'll see that in a minute. Let's sort an array of string, for instance. OK, I can write this code, take a random object and a loop. I want uh, 10 million of them. And I will uh, convert run next long to a string. So it's a, it's a particular string, because there we, we won't have any L or Z in, the, in those thri strings, but anyway. This is really Java 7 code. Of course, we live now under the reign of Java 8. We don't want to write that kind of code anymore. No one. So I can write it like that. I can use the static method generate of the stream interface. Remember, it's an interface, not a class. Pro give, it a give it a supplier to it, which is basically the, the, the previous call I, I just write. I, ju I just wrote on the previous slide. It's better. Can I do it better? Well, yes, I can do it better, because if, uh, if I want to go parallel with this code, I shouldn't be using the random here. In the random, the seed is an atomic long, so it's a contention point if I go multi-thread. So instead of that, I better be, uh, be using thread local random current next long. And this is a nice pattern. It's not the only one, but I, I prefer this one than the, the previous one. Other way, 
I've got a longs method on the thread local random. It's in fact defined on random class that returns a long string. So I can write it like that. Thread local random, current, longs, map to object. The, the, the stream returned is a long stream. So I need to, if I, if I want to, to build a, a stream of string, I need to change the type. So it's not map, it's map to object here that I need to call. And I can even go further by just writing it like that with a direct method call. Okay, so that's several patterns I can use to generate this array of strings. If I call this code, okay, I, I only want 10 million of them because I don't want to, uh, to, to watch my computer compute that for ages. And I want to sort that. Now, if I write this code and execute it, man, it's really fast, four milliseconds. Four milliseconds to draw 10 millions of randoms and convert them to strings. It's amazing, isn't it? Yes, pretty performance, right? It might be a little suspect. Four milliseconds is basically the time it takes for the JVM to warm up on my PC. So maybe, maybe not many things have been made here. Okay, let's copy the result in an array of objects. Okay, stream to array. And let, let's run it again. Oh my God, 14 seconds. What happened? <laughs> Yes, of course, laziness. Laziness, limit and sorted are just intermediate calls. They are just declarations. They don't do anything. And if I call the true array, sorry, if I call the true array, this is, the, this is what triggers the computation. So if I don't call true array, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything, so yes, it's very fast, <laughs> of course. <laughs> If I don't do anything, I can do it very fast. Okay. So there are intermediate and terminal operations. This is very important to, to understand. And a stream is processed on a terminal operation call once again. Only one terminal operation is allowed for a stream. I can't have two. And, it, and the stream cannot be processed again. It's, a, it's really a one-shot gun. I mean, once you've You've processed your data, you can't, you can't use that stream again, it's lost. But since a stream is, is a very lightweight object, once again, there's no data in it, it doesn't, a stream in itself doesn't, doesn't need a lot of memory to, to, be, to, be, created, well, to, be, to be stored, uh, it's, it's not really a problem. If I need a, another stream, then I just build another one of the same source, and it will be okay. Parallel streams. Ah, let's go parallel. At last. The first optimization I need after laziness, that, that might be the second in fact, is parallelism. Why? Because I live in a multi-core world and uh, this multi-core world implies that I go parallel if I want to, to improve my, uh, my performances. In the Java 7, I've got the fork join uh, framework, which might be a little tricky to use writing task, tuning the algorithm, choosing the right uh, splitting strategy is not always that, that simple. And going parallel that does not always bring you better performances. It is not magic dust. There's no magic behind parallelism. There's, there are overheads. You have to pay them. And at the end of the day, maybe you'll go slower uh, using parallel um, stuff. Using the parallel stream API is much more secure and much uh, safer, I think, to use. How can I build a parallel stream? I've got two patterns. Either I call parallel stream uh, to build my stream, and this will bring me a parallel stream, or either I call parallel on an uh, existing stream. Okay, very simple. Can I decide the about the number of calls my operation will use uh, to process itself? Answer is no. I can decide it globally, but not um, for each uh, kind of operation. Do I really need uh, to do that? My guess is uh, sorry. My guess is no. I don't really need that. Um, Twenty years ago, uh, a PC had like two megabytes or four megabytes of memory. And now a simple laptop. Uh, might have 8 gigabytes or 16 gigabytes of memory. So memory is not really an issue anymore. It's more resource. And um, 
thanks to the Java language, I don't have to handle the memory by hand. Thanks to this kind of API, I will not have to handle the numbers of core, uh, the number of calls by hand, neither. And I don't want to do that because in the in the future, in the next few years to come, uh, calls will become a resource as the memory is uh, nowadays. I'm pretty pretty sure of that. Is parallelism really that simple? Is it just a matter of calling parallel? Well, in a way, yes. And no, I really need to check uh, on my data on real uh, app, real use cases if it brings me better performance. This is really uh, important. Let's see that on a simple example. Let's take a stream of person. I want to limit that stream on 10 million person. The semantics of the limit method is really to return the 10 first, 10 million first element of the source. And the first element is really important. So if I go parallel on that, well, I'll have to, to track the number of elements I've, I've pulled out uh, from the source. I need to track that, so I need some kind of counter or whatever. This counter has need, needs to be visible from all the calls that will conduct the computation. So if it needs to be seen from all the calls, it needs to be some kind of atomic stuff or uh, synchronized. Well, it needs to be visible anyway. And it's, it's, it is a contention point uh, on this. So this, this might be, this is probably very tricky to write this kind of method. And this will lead to performance hit on my application. That's for sure. Let's see another example. This, this first um, for loop will generate uh, 10 million of random values, random longs in the list. Okay. Second version I generate it with a stream. This stream is limited with a limit call with 10 million as a parameter. And third version, this thread local random longs method that can take a parameter. And this parameter is the number of uh, draws I want to make uh, in, in on, the, on, on this random uh, object. I put them in the list. Once again, this pattern, we'll see that in, into details in a few minutes. I collect them and put that in the list. This is basically what it says. And I can compare the performance of this code. The serial version doesn't bring lots of differences. There's still some differences, but not much. And if I go parallel, first, I don't improve the performance. Second, there's a big difference. This time the difference is quite big between the limit call and the long uh, call, bringing, giving my 10 millions as a parameter to the long uh, call. So I need to be careful about that. I need to know in advance what I do. I need to check things. I need to test things. I need to write benchmarks uh, to, to write a really efficient parallel code. There are other methods that looks like a limit. There's a concatenation of stream, which, is, which has the same kind of, uh, of semantics. First, takes, first take the, the first elements of the stream, of stream one, and then concatenate with the elements of stream two. So I need to check, uh, do I have finished to consume all the elements of stream one to begin to add the elements of stream two in the, in the stream, uh, in the results in stream. So what I, I need to, to have, a, um, to, to have a, as an idea in my mind is that parallelism implies overhead most of the time, and I would say all the time. Badly configured parallel operation can lead to unneeded computation, and it will, instead of raising performances, it will lower them. And one, uh, one, one thing uh, really that uh, should draw attention is the ordering of the stream. If uh, going parallel on a stream that has been ordered as a hit because I need to keep the order from step to step until the end of the, of the operations. If I go back to my sorting example, I create a stream, a parallel stream. I sort it. Or maybe I will not sort it. Sorry, uh, the or not should be on the parallel stuff. Sorry. And I put that in an array this time. So I will do the computation. <laughs> So here is uh, performance uh, results. The serial version, parallel version, for 10 elements in the array list, up to 30 million elements in the array list. First thing I can see is that th this is the ratio, okay? Going parallel, if, I'm, if, I've, if I have less than 10,000 10, elements, doesn't bring much uh, to, the, to the performance, okay? 
I begin to have better performance for 100,000 elements uh, to sort. And you, you have to understand that in that case, I'm using all the calls of my, of my CPU. So if I run that in parallel, it means that the other parts of my application will not be able to use these, these other calls and uh, will might slow down because of that. And of course, when I go through 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, the, the ratio becomes uh, really nice. These tests have been conducted in a core i7 uh, processor, uh, Nehalem generation. So the Nehalem only has four physical cores. It doesn't have eight cores, as uh, Intel said. The, the, there's four physical cores and uh, hyper-threading uh, to improve this. This is the ratio between n log of n and the number of operation and the number of elements uh, sorted. I expect this ratio to be roughly uh, constant. I've got an issue here, mm, but I couldn't find out why. But this ratio is basically constant, so I guess that until uh, from 10,000 elements uh, until the end, um, the, these figures are meaningful. Okay, maybe we can go for a little question uh, slot, okay? All right, so we had Thank a bunch of questions that, uh, that, that came in. So um, one of the questions that came in before this section was, is it possible to have infinite streams? And this is a question that you've yeah. already answered, uh, that yes, streams can be infinite, unlike collections. They don't have a size method. Uh, but of course, if you have an infinite stream and you do an operation on the stream, you have to have some way to make it terminate. Because if you have an infinite stream and you say stream dot for each, well, the obvious thing is going to happen. And so some of the methods on stream are labeled what we call short-circuiting operations. Uh, so for example, uh, limit is a way of taking an infinite stream, chopping it down to a finite stream. There are methods for, you know, get me the first element or, or what have you. And so if you have an infinite stream, you have to have some way of making sure that you will eventually get to a finite answer. Uh, we had a lot of questions on default methods, and, and I'll sort of take them as a group because they kind of uh, walk around the big question. So, for example, wh you know, one, one guy said, gee, this seems a lot like Objective-C. And some guy says, gee, this seems a lot like Ruby. And someone said, this seems a little like Scala. Uh, <laughs> there's a pattern emerging, right? So, so the concept of multiple inheritance of behavior, no language has a monopoly on this. Concepts like mix-ins, uh, you know, have been around for, you know, 30 years or so, uh, may maybe longer. So the basic concepts behind, you know, the, the various different ways that languages might support multiple inheritance of behavior, th there's just not that many. There's way more languages than there are basic concepts here. So you're going to see similarities. Um, uh, to to take the languages that are probably the most similar to Java, C Sharp and Scala are probably the two closest cousins. Uh, you can look at how those two la languages handle it. C Sharp has something called extension methods, which are static methods injected in after the fact. Um, Java's default methods are virtual, which makes them a little bit nicer. Uh, Scala has a mechanism called traits, um, and you can think of uh, interfaces with default methods as being stateless traits. Some languages with traits uh, don't allow you to put variables in your traits. They're just stateless, like Fortress traits are like that. Java interfaces with the default methods are basically stateless traits. So, you know, um, if you think about it just from the evolution of Java, a couple people said, oh, it looks like a hack, because yeah, people are so polite in their comments. Um, you know, it is a little bit of a hack in the sense that Java has been around for 18 years. We have classes and abstract classes and interfaces, and we didn't want to add yet another top-level thing called trait that was a little bit like, but not exactly like interfaces. So we took the thing that was closest to what we wanted and said, well, it's a short step from here to adding behavior. The nice thing about default methods in interfaces is from the outside, you can't tell that they're default. They're just interface methods. So from the client of an interface, um, it's just a method. Okay. Um, someone asked a question, what happens with, this m with multiple inheritance for default methods if it's detected at runtime and not compile time? This is basically the same problem as any inheritance mistake. Uh, so if you use separate compilation, you can create uh, class hierarchies that are invalid. If you try to compile them consistently by feeding all the files to the compiler, the compiler will say, wait, you didn't inherit, uh, you didn't implement this method, but you can of course fool the compiler by, you know, compiling the, the classes one at a time. It's the exact same thing. The, uh, 
uh, VM is going to enforce all the same rules that the, uh, that the compiler is going to enforce, and it's going to try to figure out if there is uh, a unique, most specific default providing interface, and if so, inherit from that, and if not, it will throw an abstract method error or an incompatible class change error. Uh, okay, so, um, you know, so someone asked, all right, well, with interfaces and default methods, what do we need abstract classes for? And the answer is abstract classes have state. Interfaces don't. So a lot of the things that we used to do with abstract classes, like, uh, like an implementation like abstract list that doesn't have any fields, we, you know, it, today we could put all of that on the list interface. Uh, but if you have abstract classes that do have state and have constructors, you can model those with interfaces, so you still need abstract classes. So basically, We'll use abstract classes less and interfaces more, but abstract classes don't completely go away. All right, will the JDK 8 classes internally use lambdas on release? Some of them will, some of them won't. Uh, you know, as, um, as Jose pointed out, we've added uh, some new methods sort of scattered throughout the JDK. Give me a stream of characters from this string. Give me a stream of random numbers from this random number generator. And that's, um, you know, uh, that's all a good start. Uh, have we added every possible Lambda-friendly method we could add? No, of course not. Have we adapted all the implementation of all the existing classes to use Lambda? No, not yet. We, you know, we, we'll, we'll work on that. Um, but, you know, w we tried to do more than just the collections and, and streams. Um, okay, so more, is this like Ruby? Is this like Scala? Par parallelism, okay, great question. All right, so does parallelism actually speed things up for the kind of small tasks we do on collections usually? And, you know, this is a really good question. Uh, if you have a collection with 10 elements, parallelism is not going to help you. Um, so there's going to be a talk tomorrow by Paul Sandoz uh, about par uh, cost models for, par uh, we'll, we'll go into cost models for parallelism. But basically, uh, when you're doing a parallel operation, there's two important parameters. There's how many elements am I operating on? Call that N. And how much work am I doing for each element? Call that Q. And if the product of N times Q isn't big enough, you're generally better off going sequential. So if you have 10 elements and you want to add them up, just do it sequentially. If you have um, you know, 10 elements but you're doing some really super expensive thing like a cryptographic analysis, you might get benefit out of parallelism because that's a very high Q task. Um, the examples, you know, you gave, um, you know, it took more uh, data to get sorting to start a pay, to give you a payback than if you're just adding things up. If, if you were just going to take an array of integers and just sum them up, I think you'd probably s start to see parallelism win somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 elements on a typical, you know, two and four core machine. Uh, so, you know, if you have a tiny amount of data, no, parallelism won't help you. If you have, um, you know, if, if certain operations, as Jose pointed out, are pretty difficult to do in parallel. Limit is really hard to do in parallel. Uh, certain operations like sum, map, filter, you know, these parallelize beautifully. Um, and so you've, if you have a medium-sized data set, thousands of elements, et cetera, you probably will get a parallelism boost out of that. So we were able to make it easy to go parallel. We can't make it easy to know whether you should go parallel or not. You still have to do some thinking in your job. Um, I think that's a good thing. Some people don't. Um, so, uh, all right, let's, um, oh yeah, here's another one, looks like, insert my favorite language here. Um, so, uh, the interaction of, um, of, uh, streams and concurrent collections, um, so someone asked, if I do, if I call stream on a concurrent collection and then I do parallel on it, what's going to happen? Well, so concurrent collections, um, are, have, you know, have the added property that their contents can change any time. So uh, the, um, the, the way we, f we feed the stream with elements is a little more complicated. Uh, they have to deal with, um, you know, things being, you know, added and removed as they go. But other than, you know, which means you won't be able to predict, gee, I know the size was 10,000 when I started, so I'm going to put it into a size 10,000 array and it'll all fit. With an array list, you can do that because you know it's not going to change uh, with a concurrent... Uh, Concurrent collection, you can't necessarily uh, be sure of that. So you have to be a little more defensive about that. But otherwise, it still works perfectly. Uh, let's see. Any other questions here? Um, no, I think we're good. Let's, uh, let's okay. keep going. Right. Let's carry on. Thanks, everyone. Thank oh, you. Oh,
question from a Twitterless person here. Yes. The question is, if I don't have a Twitter account, how do I ask a question, right? And, and, the, and the answer to that is, make friends with your neighbor. Yeah. But go ahead. Uh, shout your question out. So the question is, so I can say dot parallel and turn a stream into parallel. Can I go the other way and say dot sequential? Yes, you can. And there are times when you want that. There are times when you want to do, uh, we, when you want to force things to be pro processed in a certain order, and you can say sequential for that. Right. Thank you. All right. Let's carry on. Let's talk about reduction. So we, we spent some time talking about streams. Now we'll spend some time talking about the reduction. Reduction is the real, is most of the time the, the final step of the computation, to the, so the, the, the triggering uh, operation. There are two kinds of reduction defined in the, in the API. The first kind is the, I, I would say the plain old reduction, is the fold that we just saw at the beginning of the talk. For instance, sum, average, mean, max, and so on. And the second one is the mutable reduction. Mutable reduction is about accumulating elements in a container, the, the element computed from, uh, from the data in, in my source that is pulled out by the stream, changed into a re repackage. We could, we could see that as, as a repackaging and accumulated in a, in a result container. This result container, if you want to have example, you can think about a collection or, for instance, a string builder in which I can concatenate the strings. So, once again, <laughs> this map filter reduce pattern to compute the reduction of the age, sum of the age. I would like to, to write it like that, with a sum at the end of it, okay? But the problem is that I don't have the sum method on the stream of person, because, because adding person, persons to themselves wouldn't probably makes, make a, a, a lot of sense. But I have a sum uh, method on the in stream and on the long stream and the double stream, which does make sense because I, I know how to add the numbers, of course. So how could I use this sum method on this pattern? Well, I can change things a little. I still do the same mapping. I filter, same thing. And then instead of calling, uh, of calling nothing, I can call this map to int, which will convert my stream of integer into the int stream and then make the sum method available. The value of the sum of, the, of an empty list is defined inside this method and uh, it's zero, which is, uh, which is fair. I can go uh, further. Instead of doing the mapping at the end after the filtering, I can do the mapping before because the age is already an integer, so I can create the in stream at the very beginning of my processing, then filtering, then summing. The, so the filter method is not the same as the previous one because it, the filter method from the in stream, from the in stream, instead of the filter method of the stream of integers. Okay, so this is nice. I can write it like that, and it will work. Now suppose I want to compute the max of the age. Ah, I don't like the max because it's a tricky notion. And the problem is, what is the default value for the max? What is the max of an empty set? Mm -hmm. This notion of default value is, is really not obvious because the default value is in fact the reduction of the empty set. What do I have for as a, as a value if I want to reduce the empty set with the max reduction? But it also has to be the identity element for the reduction. Why? Let's take an example. I've got two arrays, T1 and T2. I compute a reduction on T1 and a reduction on T2. I, maybe it's a, it's a parallel processing, in fact. So T1 and T2 are two parts of, okay, <laughs> sorry, are two parts. Yes, the slide would be available after the talk, of course. Uh, th th those, <laughs> those two arrays are two parts of, of, the same, uh, of the same array. So T is the reunion of T1 and T2. And the reduction of T has to be the reduction of the reduction of T1 and the reduction of T2. This is the associativity property we talked about at the beginning of this talk. Right. So now suppose that T1 is the empty set. Then in this case, T equal T2, right? And the reduction of T1 and T2 is the reduction of the reduction of the empty set and the reduction of T. Okay. 
So it means that the reduction, this is exactly the definition of that, the reduction of the empty set is the identity element for the reduction. Okay, great. So I need an identity element for the max reduction. Now the problem is that the max and min don't have an identity element. An identity element is an element for which max of E and A is A for any value of A. Okay? So I can't use the zero as a max because if I do the max of zero and minus one, it won't be minus one. So zero is not the identity element. Minus infinity could be a good candidate, but unfortunately it's not an integer. It's not even a real number, by the way. So I don't have those. the answer. What is the default value of max and min? What is the answer? The answer is simple. There is no default value for max and min. So if there's no default value, what is the return type of this max method on int stream? Well, I don't have many solutions, in fact. If it's an int, primitive type, the default value might be zero because it's the default value of the int, but I don't want to do that. So the only solution is to create another, another concept, because optional, optional int, which is here just to tell me that there might be no result. And then it's the up to the application to decide what to do with this value. Okay, so optional max equals this optional int is the return value is the return type of the max the max method. How, wh what can I do with, the, with an optional int? Well, the first pattern is I can test if uh, there is a value in it. Is value of prism then get? If it's not, then I will have to decide about the default value, which is not what I want, but I will have to do it anyway. Second pattern, I can get it as an int, which will throw no such element exception if there's no L value. Third pattern, I've got this or else method. Okay, I'll get zero if there's no, no value in it. And fourth pattern, or else throw with an exception supplier, which is a lambda expression. Well, it's, a, it's an interface, but which can be uh, um, implemented with a lambda expression. Okay, so I, I have four patterns to deal with this optional. And of course, the same goes for the max on the uh, stream um, uh, of objects and on the th three streams of numbers. So I've got four uh, interfaces optional, optional, parameter type, optional int, long, and uh, double. Okay, so what reductions do I have on stream? I've got reduce with different patterns, count, min, max, any match, all match, and non-match. Okay, those are shortcut methods. I can use those, me those uh, three methods on uh, infinite uh, streams because they, they, they can finish in a finite time. Find first, find any, it's the same. Two array, I definitely don't want to use that on an uh, infinite source. For each and for each order, ordered, sorry, uh, the same. And on uh, the reductions, uh, on, on the streams of numbers, I also have the average and summary statistics. Summary statistics is a, is a very nice little object that will do the count, min, max, sum, and average all at the same time in one object. And I can even uh, extend it if I wish to compute other statistics. So it's great. I love it. Mutable reduction. Okay, this is the second kind of reduction about accumulating r repackaged uh, object in, uh, in some kind of structure, w which could be, um, could be a collection or a string, uh, a string builder or whatever. We already wrote such a pattern in the previous slides map object to string. So basically, I, get a, I take a stream of objects, I apply the two string method, method on all, the, all of the object, and I accumulated everything in a list. Even if I don't know what the, I don't know anything about this collector's class, well, when I read this code, I, I think it's very straightforward to understand what it does. And this is exactly what I like when I, when I read code. I don't need to read hundreds of pages of documentation or whatever. To understand, to understand what it does. 
I can concatenate string with a helper, just like that. Map person dot get name collect. This is the the collect method from the stream uh, interface, and I've got another method joining on the collectors class that will just concatenate all the streams, all the strings together. This is great. Uh, this method can even take parameters to add um, separators, uh, st string separators be between the different elements uh, of the stream. So how do mutable reduction work? I need to specify a container. So the best way to specify it is to provide a constructor for this container. So it can be a constructor for a collection, which was the first example, or a constructor for a string builder. And I've, I need to have a way to add an element of the stream to the existing container. This is the basic operation that a reduction does. And since a reduction can be conducted in parallel, I also need to merge two partial results computed on two different cores of my CPU, that is to merge two, ver two partially filled uh, containers. So mutable reduction works with three, uh, three elements. For instance, uh, this is the first example, so I want to accumulate everything in, um, in a list of strings. The first element I, wa I, will, I want to give is the supplier. The supplier is the, the object that will be called to create a new array list. The second element is the accumulator. Take a partially filled container and add an element to it. So it's a B consumer. It takes an array list, supp the supply list, partially filled list, and add a stream to it. It's really simple to write. And the combiner that will just merge two partially filled, um, in that case, uh, lists. So those are the three elements I need to build a collector. Okay. I can write it. How can I write that? This is the uh, putting things together pattern. So I call the collect method here. Supply the, the, the supplier is the first uh, parameter to will be used to build the, the new array list. Then the accumulator to add existing element or incoming element to that list. And then the combiner to merge two elements. This is not very easy to read. There's a lot of code. It's a bit cluttered. I can write it like that much easier by just calling the different method uh, with the, the uh, other syntax of the lambda expression. And this is much clearer. I like that. I love it. <laughs> OK, so the collectors class. We already sh I already showed you several examples of the collectors class. And uh, I think this is really where the, 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 the nicest patterns uh, will come and will, uh, uh, will impress you, I hope, because it's really nice. The collectors class is a toolbox. There are 37 methods in it for various types of reduction and, uh, and collection. I've got nice method for counting, min by, max by, and so on. We're going to see examples uh, on all these. For instance, collecting to get the average of person.getAge. I can write it like that. Take a stream of person, collect them, calling averaging double person.getAge, and that's all. This will compute the average of the age of a population of persons. If I want to count them, all right, counting. Think about uh, w with, a, with a static import, I don't have to, to, to write the collectors uh, on, this, on this pattern. If I want to concatenate the names in the string uh, with the separator elements, I only need to write that. Very simple pattern, very easy to read and to understand. If I want to accumulate things in a list, we in the list we already done it, but we I can do it in a set too, with a two-set uh, method, three lines of code, very easy. If I want to specify a special implementation for that list, then I've got this two-collection method, and I can pass a supplier for the constructor of that list. So this will c collect all the uh, person in a tree set because I pass the tree set constructor here. So if I have my own uh, implementation of list, my own special implementation of list, of course, I can, I can put it here. If I want to, uh, I want to know, what do I want to know? The oldest person of a population. Okay, so I, get, I take my list of person, build a stream, collect. Collectors max by. This max by is, uh, is another helper method from collectors. Since it is a max by, 
it returns an optional, max and min return optionals. So this is an optional person. And then I can give as a parameter a comparator. And I have a, a bonus API with the collectors that comes in. Uh, the comparator API, to, to build comparator, I, I now I only need to write this kind of code. Comparator is still an interface. Those are static method in this uh, interface. Comparing person get last name, then comparing person get first name, then comparing person get age. This is nice, isn't it? Yes, this is nice. Is it? Uh, don't like it? Uh. <laughs> Thank you, Brian, for this one. <laughs> I, I even I have a, a, a reversed uh, if I want to to do the other way around. It's really it's really great. Very great. Okay, so the mapping. Another method from the collectors class, the mapping. It's an apply method that takes two parameters, a function, and an other collector that will be connected to the first collector that is called a downstream. And this downstream is a collector that is applied to the map value. Let's see that on an example. I've got this, the stream of person, stream of person, I collect that. I collect that in a mapping, okay? Mapping, what does it mean? I will map the person with this function, person gets last name. So it's, it's about the same that having a stream of person that will bring, uh, that will, uh, sorry, I will get a stream of names and then I collect them in a set. So it's not a set of person that I have here, it's a set of strings because get last name brings me back, uh, gives, me, gives me a string. So this is a mapping, and since this is a collector, I can add any kind of collector here. I add the two set, but I can also have the two collection and put them in a tree set. So this, is, this becomes a tree set instead of a set. Do I have other examples? No, I don't have uh, any other example, but I, I could chain collectors and collectors in, 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 its, uh, um, in its here. So we'll, we'll see other example with the, the grouping by, I think. Okay, grouping by, another static method of the collectors class. It is here to build hash maps, of course. So to build hash map, I need several information. For instance, how can I get the keys? So, sorry. I need several information. The first information is how do I build the keys? How do I build the values? By default, the values are put in a list. And maybe a downstream to further process the values. Let's see that in an example. So I take a person, stream of person. I collect them. My collector is a grouping by. I just write person.getAge. And this will build the keys. So my uh, my map, my hash map, will be a map of integer, the age of the person, and the list of the person because I didn't specify anything on the, to process the value. So this is, um, this is by default, this will take the list of a person because it is a stream of persons. Okay, nice. Now oh, let's do something trickier. I still need, uh, I still want to have ages as uh, keys to my, um, to my map. But this time I don't want a, a list, I want a set because I don't want uh, any, any doubles in my list. So I just add this collector. It's a downstream collector to build sets uh, of persons instead of lists. Oh, great, but wait, this is a collector. So, can, so I can play further with this new toy. Okay, so if it, this is a collector, I can put a mapping in here and get on the mapping, I, I apply this mapping get last name, so instead of a set of person, I will get a set of, a st of stream, and this mapping can add, can uh, accept a collector here, so instead of getting a list of strings, sorry, I can build a set of string. So this last name will go in the string here, and since I asked for to build a set here, I will have a set on my ma in, my ma in my map. So those three lines are the downstream of the grouping by collector that is here. Great. If I want a tree set instead of a, instead of a set, okay, no problem, collectors to collection, tree set new, and this will be a tree set. I can continue to play a uh, long time with this, this, this kind of thing, and if I want to change the implementation of this map, well, I need to pass another argument to the grouping by, which is here, tree map 
new. This is the constructor of the of the accumulator. In fact, if I uh, go back to the to the previous uh, pattern, so th this is the constructor of the accumulator, and the accumulator becomes a tree map. So I can really uh, customize the the map that is written by the grouping by uh, as I want, and this is great. I love that. <laughs> if I want to create an age histogram, for instance. So I'm not interested in the list of person, I'm only interested in the number of person per age. Well, person, that stream, collect, collectors grouping by, because this is a map, so I will use a grouping by. I've got another method to create um, uh, maps, we'll, we'll see that in a minute, so grouping by. The key is the age of the person, and what do I do on the downstream? I just count the persons in the list. So I end up with integer, this is the age of the person, and the long here, because counting the, the person uh, returns uh, along as a, uh, as, a, as a type. So it gives me the number of person by age in this map. Yeah, one line of code basically. Nice. Another method of the collector's API, the partitioning by. Partitioning by is here also to create a map, but it's a special map with the Boolean as the, as the key. So Boolean, of course, can be true or false, no other value. And I, of course, I can specify a downstream too. So for instance, get a person, stream, collect, partition by age. This is the filter I want to, uh, uh, well, this, this method takes a filter as a parameter, age greater than 20. So I'll have two keys in my map, false for people younger than 20 and true for people older than 20. Pretty straightforward. If I want to uh, further process the list of operation, okay, so it's a partitioning by, so it's still a map of Boolean with a Boolean other key, sorry. And here is my downstream collector. Collector does mapping, I do a mapping, so I change the person in the stream, uh, sorry, uh, I only uh, keep the last name of the person, so this is a string. And since it is a mapping, I can further specify another downstream, so th that's a second downstream, and this downstream will create a new a structure to all my names, which is a tree set. So I end up with a map, boolean, true or false, and tree set of strings. And this tree set of strings will all the names of the person I have in my, uh, in my stream. Great. Okay, so our partition with the people uh, uh, older than 20, gather their names, put that in a tree set. The collecting and then, um, is aim is to collect data with a downstream, then apply a function called a finisher. A finisher may be seen as a post-processing of, uh, of, uh, of the collection. It's useful for putting the result in an immutable collection. This is great for doing that because of course I can't build I can't build the immutable collection up front because if I do that, I will not be able to add any elements in it, which is, of course, not what I want to do. So how does it work? Person, stream, collect. Collectors collecting and then. All right. So I want, th this, is a, th this is a collector that I, 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 I give as a parameter to the collecting and then method. This is a grouping by. I want to group by grouping by, so this will be a map. I want to group by my set my um, collection of person by their age, so it will be a map of integer as the age and the list of persons. Since I didn't specify any downstream to the gr to the um, sorry grouping by method here, and the collecting and then takes a finisher. Finisher is here map uh, map entry set, so it will execute the entry set method on a resulting map of my first collector. So in the end, I will have a set of map entry. The integer is the age that I've uh, specified here, and the list of person is the default, sorry, yes, is the default um, value of this map, since I didn't put any downstream on the grouping by call here. Of course, I could do that. Okay, I didn't. <laughs> sorry. Um, Maybe we could do a little live coding on that. Do we have time for that? Oh, I think we have time for that, yes. No? I've got, um, okay, so thi this code, I will not go into the details for, for the beginning of the code. The code I will write will be here. I've got a file with 
I wouldn't say all, but I guess most of the McDonald's restaurants uh, in the USA. This, uh, this very beautiful code is just here to read the file and to put everything in a, a list here. I can run that. Sorry, maybe I could go full screen. I can run that. So I've got like 14,000 McDonald's in the USA. What do I want to do with that? I, I know in each object McDonald's, I know, I know the, the city in which those McDonald's are. So what I would like to do is uh, find the city with the biggest number of McDonald's in it. So, okay. So I take my list, build a stream on it. I, I want, sorry, I want to get um, the number of McDonald's per city. So this looks like uh, hash map. So I will be using my collect method. This is this I don't want. Okay, and I will use the collector grouping by. I need to specify, does it work? Oh my God, okay. I need to specify uh, the key um, uh, I want to that. So the, the key will be the city. So my McDonald's is something like that, oh, sorry. Magdo, Magdo point dot city. So this is my key. And I will specify the downstream. I am interested in the number of McDonald's per city. So all I want to do is to count the McDonald's instead of having the, the list. So counting is what I need. So this is already, what do I have here? I've got a map because of the grouping by. The key of the map, the city is a string, I think. Okay, I think it's a, it's a string. So it's a map of string and long because I count all the, the values in the list. All right. So this should compile, great. And now what I want to do is further process the stuff, getting the only the couple map entry in which the, um, the counting of the city is the, is the biggest. So I've got two options to do that. The first option is once I've got this stream, this is a map, so I can call the entry set on it. Sorry, I will command this. So I can just take the entry set. Okay, an entry set is a set, so I can build a stream on it. I can take the stream on it, and I want a max cache. Okay, max. I need a comparator, and the comparator will be comparing. What will be what will it be comparing? Um, entry get value. Will it work if I write it like that? Okay, it does. It's a max, so what is the written type of this? It's a max, so it has to be an optional. And an optional of what? Well, an optional of this type, in the of the type of this stream, which is the stream built on an entry set, so it must be an entry set. Uh, sorry, an optional of entry. Entry of what? Entry of city, which is a string, and long, which is the value of the counting here. So I call that opt and it compiles. So I didn't make any mistake. That's right. Let's execute let's execute that. Okay, so Houston. Houston is the city in the USA with the most McDonald's. I think it would have been interesting to cross this with the cholesterol uh, statistics. No, I don't have this file at hand. But we can do better here. We can do better. This code is really not nice code. I think I can do better. I think that on the entry object itself, entry is an interface, right? But I've got static methods on interface. 
and I can directly compare by key, by value, or compare by key by supplying a comparator if my key is a complex object. So I can write it like that. Mm, great. But if I can write it like that, maybe I can also write it like that. Does it work? Ah, it doesn't. Too bad. Maybe NetBeans is not so good at compiling this. Okay. Does it do the same? Yes, it does do the same. I could have also write, uh, written it with, um, with this pattern, with the, with the collecting and then. Let's try that. Okay, so I'll comment that code. And insert here collectors, collecting and then. Oops, sorry. Collecting and then, so collecting and then takes a group by and takes the finisher. So I need to add the finisher after my group by here. And the finisher is just just map oops and reset. And it's set up. So what do I have here? I've got a stream of entry set. So I don't need this code anymore but I do need this one, which is the max, computation of the max. It doesn't compile, what doesn't it compile? What did I? Uh, so the collect is here. Yes, I need to call stream again, because the result, thank you. Why did I uh, need to call stream again? Because the result is a um, is a is a li is a, sorry, the result is an entry set with well, a set an, of entry sets, correct? Uh, and it doesn't compile, while because ah because NetBeans lost the type of the integer in that case. Okay, but it's still Houston with 135 uh, McDonald's in it. So you can see that writing this kind of code is um, really another habit um, than writing uh, iterable code. Uh, hopefully it will be for the best, of course. Okay, and I think this is our last round of question. Yes, okay, we've got Ten all minutes. right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we have a few more questions. Um, so, um, someone asked about the uh, parallel method on streams. Can I call at any time? Can I say stream.parallel.filter or stream.filter.parallel? And the answer is yes. And they all mean the same thing because, as uh, Jose mentioned, uh, you have your intermediate operations that set up the uh, calculation, and then all the work happens when you get to the terminal operation. So you could say stream.parallel.sequential.parallel, <coughs> the last, only the last one counts. And then when you get to the terminal operation, that's when it actually executes sequentially or in parallel. All right, somebody asked, um, how, how can you call the sort method lazy? Um, you know, don't you have to consume all the elements to sort? a stream. And the answer there is, yes, it's a little confusing. The sort method is lazy in the sense that it doesn't do any sorting when you call it. Uh, it waits until you get to the terminal operation and then it does all the mapping, filtering, sorting, what have you. But sort, uh, the sorted method of stream operation is one of those stateful operations that uh, Jesse talked about where um, you know, with, with map, you consume one element, you produce one element. With sorting, you have to consume all the elements before you can produce any element. And so the sorting is going to, you know, when you get to that stage, it's basically acting like a full barrier, but it's still lazy in that it doesn't do the sorting until you actually um, ask for it. What happens when you call sum on an infinite stream? The obvious thing, <laughs> it will take a very long time to compute the sum. <laughs> Uh, just like an infinite loop, right? You know, for, uh, while true, it'll do exactly what you ask. Computers are dumb. Okay, so here's a, here's a really good question. When processing reductions in parallel, is ordering maintained? And what are the pitfalls? So the answer is, uh, if the input of the stream has a defined order, like a list has a defined order, an array has a defined order, um, but uh, a set doesn't, if the input has a defined order, then we commit to processing it in order. 
Um, and that's why when you do a reduction, one of the requirements of a reduction is that the reducer be associative, because that's what enables you to break a reduction up into parallel and, um, and, and still get the right answer. Sometimes the ordering constraint has a cost. Uh, with reduction, it really doesn't. With for each, it doesn't. But if you're doing something like a limit or a grouping by, then preserving order actually can be fairly expensive in parallel. And there are times when you s say, well, I know my stream has an order, but I don't really care about that order. I just want the answer. Um, you can say, throw away the order. There's an unordered method. Um, and in those cases where the performance makes a difference, uh, you can say, "All right, discard the ordering, um, and then do my, um, you know, and, and you know, and, and then do uh, the rest of the operations. You may get a faster value. But by default, it will preserve order if there is one." Uh, okay. Can a method return a lambda expression? So yes, pretty much, sort of. If I understand what you mean correctly, a lambda expression is a way of creating an instance of a functional interface. Uh, so if you have a method that creates a lambda and it returns it, what it's really returning is that instance of a functional interface. There's no such thing called lambda in the type system. A lambda is a kind of expression in the language that evaluates to an instance of a functional interface. Uh, I think the underlying question is, can I write higher ordered functions in Java? And the answer is absolutely yes. You can write, uh, like um, the example we just gave with comparator, uh, was an example of a higher order function where uh, you say comparator.comparing and you give it person colon colon get age, that's a function from person to int, and it returns a comparator of person, which is a, a function from person comma person to int. Um, and so you can write uh, higher order functions in Java, um, but you know, the, the, the notion of lambda ex doesn't exist in the type system. Uh, the, the way it's reflected in the type system is it's the interface to which you're converting it, function, predicate, what have you. Will there be something like link in a future version of Java? I don't know. That's the future. <laughs> I can't predict the future. Um, oh, all right, here's a question I, I never like to see. <laughs> Looks like I have to learn a new language. Ah. Well, so you have to learn some new features. But the set of uh, features we added to Java and Java 8 are actually relatively small. Lambda expressions, a new kind of expression for making uh, instances of interfaces. Method references, which are basically just like lambdas. And then you have default methods and static methods and interfaces, which again build on concepts that already exist in Java. So the set of new features is small. What you will have to learn is a new set of concepts and ways of attacking problems if you want to use them effectively. And that does involve some learning. But um, you know, we work very hard to uh, reduce the, you know, the size of the feature set without adding 500 new features. In fact, Java 8 adds fewer new features than Java 7 did. It's just it adds features that will make more of a difference in your everyday coding. Um, here's another one I don't like to see, but I'll read it anyway. Gee, lambdas in Java 8 is a nice try, but the syntax is horrible, and it's unreadable compared to other functional languages. Well, OK, we're not trying to compete with functional languages. We picked the exact same syntax as Scala and C Sharp. So if you think the Java syntax is horrible, then the Scala syntax is equally horrible, and the C Sharp syntax is equally horrible. But Java is not a functional language. It's not intended to be a functional language. It's an object-oriented language uh, that we are picking up some influence from functional languages, just like Scala did, um, uh, just like um, you know, and, uh, you know, ju just like a lot of other languages. Those languages don't attempt to compete with functional languages either. It's a different approach, but oh well. If you don't like it, you don't have to program in it. Uh, okay. Um, are lambdas loaded by the class loader? That's an interesting question. So um, what, 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 ha what happens uh, with lambdas, I'll have actually a whole talk about this tomorrow called Lambdas Under the Hood. Uh, I'll talk all about the mechanics of what the VM does when it sees a lambda and you know, what the class loading Im implications of are for that are. And I think that comes to the end of our questions. So okay. I'll hand it back to you, Jose. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> So those are other examples. I will not go in too much into the details because I, my first plan was uh, was to to do that um, in live coding, but uh, time is running out, so we'll skip that one. Basically, what do I do? I take a stream of movie, I build a map of year per movie. Movie, in fact, is just like some some kind of hash map, like the the, the McDonald's. All right. I build an entry set 
on these, then I compare by value the entry uh, of the movie, and so I can get, th this code will get me the, um, the year with the most produced movie uh, during it. Okay. And it's an optional because an optional, once again, is the default return value uh, of a max. And this, the max is here. Some thoughts on parallel. So we have two ways to go parallel. First, to we can create a parallel stream up front, or we can call the parallel method on a given stream, or a set control maker method to go back to set control. When uh, the terminal operation is initiated, the operation are being processed in parallel or in serial, depending on the mode of the stream. There are some operations like find, find any that will not give you reproducible results in parallel. This is the trick with parallel. If I compute a sum in parallel, it will always be the same. If I compute any kind of reduction in parallel with an associative uh, lambda expression or an associative function in general, it always it will always bring me, bring me the, the same result. But if I call some kind of method like find any, it might not bring me the, the same result. If I call find first and I execute that in parallel, if, if, the, if the, first, the, the, the first element to that, that, I, that I may find would may be maybe the, the tenth element of the stream, or, or the array the stream is built on, but it can also be the thirteenth. And I, I, can't, I can't predict that. So there are things that are not reproducible in parallel. And, and this is a, a new notion when I, um, when I come from a serial world. The parallel processing of streams has to be freed from constraint. And this is, uh, I think, very important to get. The ordering, for instance, is costly. And keeping the order during a parallel operation will need synchronization visibility among all the threads that will uh, compute the parallel stuff. So relaxing ordering may lead to better performances. And once again, going parallel blindly will surely uh, uh, lead you to, to, to bad, well, bring b will, bri will bring bad things to you. To you, you shouldn't be doing that without a little benchmarking and some testing. And this is time for me to conclude this, uh, this long talk. The first question was, why are lambdas introduced in Java 8? And you can read many blogs and uh, many things on the web about that. The first thing we, that, that can come to mind is because it's in the mood. <laughs> and this is crazy because what used to be in the mood 40 years ago might not be in the mood nowadays. Okay? So you, we don't bring, you don't bring that, you don't use a solution to, to solve your application just because it's in the mood. Right. All right, lambdas are in the mood, I, it's true, but will they be in the mood in 10 years from now? Probably not, but will we still be using them? Second reason, because it allows one to write more compact code. This is true, Gun, but compact code is not a goal into itself. All right? This is compact code. It's C code, all right? I, I didn't try to, to convert it to Java, but I think it's doable. This is C code, and guess what? It works. If you run it, it will bring you this result. This is called a Mandelbrot set. This code has, in fact, been submitted to a contest about 20 years ago, I can't remember exactly when, a contest of the most unreadable C code. And guess what? It did not win. <laughs> The guy who won the, that contest, I can remember it perfectly well, was able to write his email address in the center of this Mandelbrot set. So compactness is not a goal into itself. If you need five lines of code to write something that is readable, then use those five lines of code. Don't try to write 20 lines because it wouldn't make sense, but don't try to, to write only one line because it, it would not lead to, to readable code. Lada, lambdas are being introduced because it is necessary for new application, because it leads you to, to better and easier ways of bringing parallelization into your processing. And this is really something needed by both modern application and API writers. 
Tarite is coming. It's the biggest update in uh, more than 15 years, in fact, because it's the biggest update ever, most probably. Moving to Java 8 will mean probably a lot of work for us as developers. Self-training, changing our habits, the iterable pattern is changing, so this is really important for us. Convincing our bosses, which will probably not be the easiest things to do. Some hints on how to self-train yourself. There are three books announced on Amazon. The first one is scheduled for December, the two others scheduled for April. You can download the preview version on the OpenJDK site, so please do it. The release date is set up for the 18th March 2014. Yes, okay, so we'll have it at that date. We already have a, a preview version, so use it, test it, train yourself on it. Uh, in DevOps, there's tomorrow morning an opening keynote about Lambda Expression. Brian Gertz here is giving a, a, a very interesting talk at um, 12 o'clock tomorrow, um, Lambda, a peek under the wood, and Paul Sandoz will give another one just after that. In conclusion, I would like to, to cite, uh, to, to quote James Gosling in 1997, he said, Java is a blue color language. It's a language to help you solve problems, to help you please build application. Recently, Brian Goetz said on InfoQ that language features are not a goal unto themselves. So, and I like to see those two sentences together because I think this is really the same kind of idea. Java is still a language that will help us to build application and to solve problems. And this is a very good news. Java, even after Java 8 and after all these new things we saw this morning, Java is still Java. And with that, this is my conclusion. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> and we still have some time for question and answer. We still have four minutes for that. So if you still have questions, please. <laughs> No more questions? Maybe some more. Okay. So thank you a lot, Brian, for being here and for participating in the design of, uh, of, this, uh, of this talk and for uh, all your participation through the answers on Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much.